So what I'm going to do tonight is um, I'm going to show you slides from the project that I've been working on for over 10 years. Um, the project involved, evolved into a collaboration with the composer from Mexico uh, who lives in the United States now, Guillermo Galindo. And uh, I'll sort of flesh that out as we go. But primarily, I'll be showing my work and a few examples of Guillermo's work. Um, Guillermo couldn't be here. Uh, we have a show opening at the Eamon Carter Museum, and he's installing the show there uh, tomorrow. So he couldn't be here tonight. So you've just got me looking for my clicker. So um, the Border Cantos essentially began in 2004 uh, as part of an ongoing project called the Desert Cantos, where I wandered the U.S. Mexico or the U.S. Um, American desert and uh, look for projects. I've been doing it for almost 40 years, photograph things like uh, fire, man-made fires, floods, um, nuclear test sites, uh, space shuttle landings, and so on. Things that happen in the American Western landscape that are kind of a collision between the natural world and the civilized world. And in around 2004, I started discovering things along the border that became the beginnings of this project. And in 2009, as the uh, border became militarized, uh, we started seeing more walls being built, um, sent ground sensors, drones, uh, surveillance cameras being employed to go along the border. Um, this photograph, which was made in California in 2009, represents the beginning of a uh, new escalation of wall building. I photographed from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. It's almost 2,000 miles of border between the U.S. and Mexico. And the first canto, um, basically I, I divide my projects into um, subsections called cantos. So in the Border pro Cantos project, there's eight cantos, and the first one is called the wall. And essentially, the, it's photographs of the different iterations of border wall uh, through the 2,000 miles from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. What's interesting about these walls, so far um, out of the 2,000 miles, there's about 680 miles of walls. And they take different forms, different materials. And I'll show examples of those. Uh, these walls that have been uh, most recently built cost about 4 to $12 million a mile to build. Some of the walls, um, like the ones I just showed, are to keep people out. Uh, these walls are called vehicle barriers. Um, and actually, this is a Normandy-style um, uh, fence, which basically just keeps out vehicles. People can get over it. But in remote areas of the desert, it's uh, very effective of, in keeping out uh, four-wheel drive and Jeeps and things like that. Um, one of the things that's interesting about these walls is that they don't work. Um, as we spend more and more money towards building these, we're finding that, in fact, one of the problems with the walls is that uh, in, because they are so threatening, people come over from the border and don't go back to Mexico. In the past, um, there's been a sort of fluid migration back and forth. Workers would come across to work for seasonally and then go back to their families, take the money with them, invest in the economy there, and there'd be this kind of actually productive cycle. Uh, as we've escalated the wall building uh, and the threats of being uh, deported and criminalized, uh, people tend to um, either come here and stay or stop crossing altogether. As you can see, there's different shapes and forms of wall. Um, many of the walls actually look like they, in recent years, look like they've been Richard Serra knockoffs. They're made out of cordon steel. Uh, they're rusting, red, um, same material. So I, my, my theory is, is that some design students who work for the government have been studying Serra. Also, you can see the influence of um, you know, Jean-Claude and Christo's running, running fence. Some of the places are quite beautiful. It's interesting, though. Um, one of the arguments about why we're, there's so much push now, political push, to um, build these walls is that there's a, um, 
a challenge to national sovereignty uh, in, our, in our era that, that we never experienced before. And basically be between the internet, migration, um, uh, terrorism, um, viruses, things like that, that don't know traditional national boundaries, uh, that many governments are starting to build walls uh, with, the, with this kind of false notion that this might be able to uh, keep, keep nations independent. But uh, everything is just too fluid. This is a cabbage crop in Texas. And this is uh, in the, the uh, sand dunes in the California desert. So the wall goes through very remote areas. It also cuts through urban areas. This is Nogales, where the wall cuts a, a city in half. That's Nogales, Arizona on the north, and Nogales, Sonora to the south. Communities are often split. Um, this is interesting. The walls before the Richard Serra style walls um, were actually made from um, uh, metal uh, landing mats used for helicopter landings during the Vietnam War. And then after the war, they were recycled and, and built as the first walls. This is kind of an iron mesh wall. So you can see there's different forms of fabrication. Online, you can see a video of two girls climbing the wall in under 18 seconds without the aid of a ladder. Um, basically, the wall is easy to go over. Uh, the people have tunneled under, and it's easy to go around. There's many places where the wall just stops. Essentially, the wall is just a, a arbitrary line in the sand between the two countries. Sometimes the walls are um, sort of improvised. Uh, this was an area in California where apparently um, uh, doom buggies were coming through with drugs. So they, somebody decided to build a wall and they just took these um, iron pipes and fabricated this beautiful sculpture. In this case, uh, which is not aesthetically as interesting, um, this was a Normandy style wall that had been cut through uh, nine times in November 2015 by, by drug smugglers. And what they would do is use a blowtorch and in five minutes cut through, drive through, and get their drugs. And then the Border Patrol would come and try to patch it back together. And clearly, this, uh, these guys weren't, didn't have the art training that this guy did. Um, this is in Oregon Pipes, Arizona. Uh, this is, again, a Normandy. Uh, style wall, a vehicle barrier. Um, but as you can see, not only does it not do a good job of keeping people out, it doesn't, not very effective keeping vehicles out because they can drive right around it. Uh, this is actually in Los Indios, Texas. And in 2012, I photographed here. And I thought that uh, this section was so unusual that maybe it hadn't been finished, it was, maybe it was a gate that needed to be completed, or uh, just it was under construction, something like that. So I came back three years later, and in 2015 photographed it, and the only thing that had changed is some nice grass had grown at the base. And this again, this is in Arizona, this is again the old uh, uh, landing pads um, for the helicopters from Vietnam this particular section of wall. And this leads me to talk a little bit about my collaboration with Guillermo. So I've been photographing, and um, I saw Guillermo perform um, at a pop-up magazine in San Francisco. He had built some instruments out of uh, migrant artifacts that he found on the Texas-Mexico border. And so um, I had been photographing along the border, and I 
found some things which I'll show in a minute, um, uh, human effigies that were made out of migrant artifacts found on the border, and I thought it'd be a great collaboration. And so we started collaborating, and um, ever since uh, I was going to the border so often that when I would see things that I think would make an interesting um, instrument for Guillermo, I would bring them back for him. So I found a section of this um, landing mat, helicopter landing mat border wall that was bent, and I got this fellow to help me take it, and we sent it back to my studio, and Guillermo built this gong out of it. Makes an extraordinary sound. That's Guillermo in my studio practicing. The second canto is called The Effigies. And th these I made in uh, 2009. They're basically uh, scarecrows made out of migrant clothing uh, put on um, agave stalks on the California-Mexico border. And then 2009, I made these. And it was uh, 2011, I think, that I saw Guillermo perform on his instruments that he made from things he found on the border. And I thought, wow, this could be really interesting, these two mediums coming together that kind of have a similar, similar structure, if you will. And these, uh, these effigies were really mysterious. Um, uh, when I found them, I, uh, and for a couple weeks I photographed them, I didn't see anybody around. There's probably maybe two dozen of them sprawled along the desert in this area. And um, I didn't know if they were an artist project. I didn't know if they were warnings to migrants coming across the border. I didn't know if they were warnings to the uh, uh, protests against the border patrol. And, um, and actually, at some point, um, you know, talking to people, I found out that, that these were created from <coughs> things found on the border. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, uh, but I, I had the opportunity to meet the, the people that made them, and then I decided I really didn't want to know, because maybe they just hate Mexicans, and there's some dark thing to it. So I liked the fact that these were really uh, enigmatic and um, compelling, and didn't want, to, didn't want to know too much about them, actually. That's the way I found them. When I saw Guillermo perform, and I had made these, had already made these, I invited him to my studio, because we didn't, I didn't know his work, he didn't know mine. I invited him to my studio, and I had large prints of these all around my studio. And that's when we decided to, to work together, and it's been four years that we've been collaborating. And so Guillermo was inspired by these sculptures made on the border, so he made an instrument uh, like that. This is from clothing that I brought back from the border. And if you look carefully, you can see these strings that Guillermo uh, plays and, and plucks. There's a sounding board in the chest that he pounds on. And it sounds like this. Uh, the next canto is called Target Practice, and in Texas, I found a uh, shooting range, practice range for the Border Patrol. Um, I snuck in and with my iPhone made a lot of photographs of what I could find. These are the targets. What's that? Yes. And they're in the, tr you know, there's an exhibition, uh, so the exhibition's comprises of um, really large-scale photographs made with the big camera and then also uh, quite a few, about a third of the exhibition are made of iPhone photographs. They print beautifully. And I also photographed these shells on the ground. 
you know, thousands and thousands of spent shells. And knowing Guillermo, I, I put them all in some plastic trash bags. And they made a great sound in my bags, and I knew I was onto something. And it was interesting, actually, because I started, one of the things that you don't see in this project at this point is, is the emails back and forth. So I'm on the road traveling a lot um, and sending images of things I'm finding and communicating back and forth. So there's this ongoing uh, relationship uh, as, uh, on the fly, if, if you will, and it was kind of exciting. I also didn't know if I was going to end up in jail or what was going to happen. But anyway, I collected these. Then I, there's another uh, canto called Ball Games, which is not in the show or the book right now. Eventually, I'll publish it. But basically, I started finding soccer balls and tennis balls, golf balls, ping pong balls, all kinds of balls on this side of the border, and, you know, from, from California to the Gulf of Mexico. And I was going, what is this? And I finally figured out that kids on the other side play, and the ball goes over, and then there's nobody who will throw it back. Right? So um, if I saw kids, I would throw them back. And I actually photographed two kids playing soccer on the other side. It comes in a later photo. But I, I grabbed these balls. This is a soccer ball. This is another one. First one's in Arizona. This is in California. I brought these back for Guillermo. Guillermo was inspired by the soccer balls and the shotgun shells and drew this idea for a, based on an African Shakir shaking drum, um, instrument but he called it a, a soccer ball piñata uh, because of the colorful shotgun shells of the Border Patrol. They're pinks and blues and reds and oranges, be really beautiful. He thought it was more like a, a party uh, game. So based on that, mm -hmm. he, he made this soccer ball shaped piñata. And this will give it scale. That's Guillermo performing it. Amazing sound. Yeah, he's kind of, um, I, I didn't bring videos of everything. Uh, actually, if you go to bordercantos.com, uh, you can see him actually playing it. But you just, you kind of roll it or shake it or throw it. And it just, it's just amazing what the sounds that it makes. Another canto is called Cutting for Sign. This is when the Border Patrol, inspired by an ancient uh, American Indian custom uh, of, um, tracking, they would drag things along the ground to smooth the sand so you could see footprints or other kinds of tracks. So, but the Border Patrol, they, they drag tires behind their trucks. Sometimes it's one tire, sometimes it's seven. From the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico, you find them everywhere, and everyone is different. Clearly, they're, they're, they're improvising. Whoever's making them, and it must be individual Border uh, Patrol agents, they improvise and make whatever they think they need. Kind of a strange ritual. In the show, there's a grid that's actually larger than this. I think it's almost 32 feet long. The top row is California, the second row is Arizona, the third is New Mexico, and the fourth is Texas. So you can see that it's, it's a widely used practice. Basically, from one to three times a day, they, they drive along the road. Um, they erase the tracks from the day before. And if they see tracks, they obviously call it in and they send people out looking for them. So they're er erasing um, the footprints from the day before and then making a fresh sweep for the next round. And it's interesting, uh, it's so crude and it's, it's almost like a Ardo Povera sculpture. You know, it's got this kind of crude fabrication quality to it, which is kind of amazing. Um, but it's also interesting on how crude it is compared to all this high-tech surveillance that's going on with the drones and the, the um, uh, these surveillance cameras and really expensive um, uh, processes. This is very simple and crude, and apparently it's more effective. Along with tires, which is the most common thing you'll see, you'll see all kinds of strange things that they drag. This, these are um, car wash brushes, which I found a bunch of those. Obviously, for different kinds of terrain, they've had to um, improvise. This was in Texas, and this is like another beautiful, whoever did this went to art school. It's just a beautiful, or, or it was in S&M or something, because there's some very strange nails and metal things going on in this thing. It's very, very unique. That was the only one I found like that. 
And here you have tires and chains. There's the, there's the tracks, you can see the way the, the chain, so it leaves a different kind of track behind it rather than being smooth. I don't know if you can see this, but this is actually one of the smoothed out areas from a tire. And you can see my footprint in an animal footprint. And it, it's, very, it's very effective. So this is another interesting component because it, it opened up, opens up another practice of Guillermo's. This is uh, five tires uh, being dragged along the sand, but it looks like a musical staff. So Guillermo picked up on that, um, or actually I, I was so excited, I sent it to him, I said, I, I got a musical staff for you. And he started making graphic scores, a la John Cage. And so if you look at this is, if you turn it on its side, you can see how he's incorporated those lines into it. And Guillermo made a number of graphic scores that are in the book, in the exhibition. Um, what I mean by graphic scores is they're no longer traditional, you know, black notes on, 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 a, on a staff. It it's, uh, could be any kind of visual um, drawings that, that evoke sounds. And he uses these all the time in, in his compositions. This was another idea that Guillermo had. Really interesting. Um, this is, he calls this the Zapatello. This is, was inspired by, by Leonardo da Vinci's Martello. And it's basically, the Martello was a, um, uh, a hand crank percussion, a hammering machine, and uh, done in, you know, in the Renaissance. Um, this, um, this has a tire at the bottom and a shoe. And this is a rough idea, but he drew this, showed it to me, and then I, that to me was my mandate to go out and find stuff. So um, I found that boot, and then in front of it's actually a copy, a letterpress copy of Dr. Zhivago in Spanish that apparently somebody dropped, you know, jumping the fence, they lost their boots and their, and their, their book. Um, oh, and that's a, a tire that I, that I brought back. I brought back probably a half dozen tires, different sizes, not knowing what he would need. And this is the final uh, Zapatello. So the Zapatello, you can see it's got the, the tire, boot, and a glove brought back from the border. The gears uh, used to, in the churning of the, of the, uh, with the crank, uh, to, to hit the tire with the drum, with the um, boot and the, and the glove, um, is made based on the um, targets, the same shape as our manufactured, but they're actually gears. And it's hard to see, but yeah, you can't see it there. You can see there's two bones up there. There's actually, um, a, a ram's jaw and a bullhorn that are also part of it that Guillermo found on the Texas border. Oh, and the wood uh, blocking was um, blocking I brought back that was used to in the construction of the border wall. So all these objects have some relationship to the border. Uh, another canto is called Against the Wall. Um, the subtitle is The Third Nation. Basically, along the border, this 2,000-mile stretch, um, it's no longer really the U.S. or Mexico. It's, it's its own kind of nation with its own culture, with its own language, with its own economy, its own politics. This is uh, Yuma, Arizona. A lot of times the wall goes through very poor communities because richer communities would not let the walls be built in their backyard. It's a cemetery in Brownsville. Um, property values wherever the wall's been built um, definitely have gone down. Um, this is an abandoned um, construction site. And in the print you can actually see um, the wall in the background, and lots of for sale signs up. This is, um, I'm in Calexico in California looking into Mexicali, and you can see how the wall is just built right up against the community. In San Ysidro, California, there's a huge shopping mall. Um, it actually used to be a shopping mall that people from both sides of the border would use now with the wall. 
going right through it. It's a little more complicated, but it's this big fancy shopping malls in contrast to the other side of the border where people would build their homes and it's hard to see in the slide, but basically the wall is being used as the fourth wall to the, to the, um, to the house itself. In Texas, and this is really interesting because it relates to Trump's wanting to build a, basically a $25 billion wall. Um, the problem with building a wall, most of the wall now is, is currently in, in California and Arizona. Um, in Texas, there's some portions of wall, but it's very difficult to build there because the, the border is defined for a thousand miles by the Rio Grande River. And the Rio Grande River winds like this, just curves radically. So you can't put a wall practically along there. You have to put it above it, inland, which means that anybody that owns property on those curved areas, basically on the, on the river uh, or just inland of that, gets cut off. And so a lot of the local people in Texas that are on the wrong side of the wall are freaked out because there's a bunch of US citizens that are on the Mexico side of the wall but uh, trapped on the wrong side of the fence. And so it's a big controversy uh, to build the wall that that Trump is talking about, that's where he has to build it. And there's no way that it can be done. Um, Americans would go haywire. Um, here I'm actually on a munici municipal golf course that's on the wrong side of the wall. And when I was photographing this young boy you know, teeing off, the Border Patrol came and told me that, you know, it was really dangerous where I was and the cartel was going to take my camera and that kind of thing. And, you know, it was just, it was just I was in the U.S. It was just very strange. This is the University of Brownsville. This is a uh, orange orchard. Uh, this is um, Big Bend National Park, and the Rio Grande defines the park and, and the two countries, and there's no wall there, and people just wave back and forth as they've been doing for for centuries. Yes, that's, yeah, sorry, it's hard to see the small slides, but uh, there's a, somebody just walking, literally walking across. What they do there, um, where this is, uh, people in the, in the town across the way make um, artifacts like little um, uh, walking canes or, or jewelry or things like that, then bring them over, put them on rocks on this side, and we leave a jar and say, you know, five dollar donation, take what you want. And people do, you know, they do, and they leave the money, and then they come back all day long. They just come and they they get their jars of money, and it goes on. And the the state park, the national park people look the other way, and it just it goes on all the time. Yeah, almost all the pictures were shot. Uh, one one picture I, I photographed of the the house constructed uh, that was on obviously the Mexico side and. Uh, there's some, 99% of what I shot was on the U.S. side, though. Uh, this is actually uh, a surveillance blimp in Marfa, Texas. And these are those uh, surveillance camera towers, which you'll see all along the border. And this is a vulture protecting the border. Um, long story here, which I won't go into, but this is a, 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 a monument to a vigilante group and a, a guy that, one of the heads that died there. Um, this will need to read. I have a detail of it. Um, so this was done before the Republican race for the um, presidency, before Trump became a candidate. Um, and it indicates that the, the racism was very much there. Um, it's graffiti in California that I found which says, we must, must secure the existence of our race and, I can't read it. Thank you, and for white children, preserve the future for white children, basically. This was in California. Uh, this is an altar on the Mexico side of the border. Basically, somebody was shot trying to climb the fence here. Was there a high-pitched sound? Everybody hearing that, or is that just me? It's 
me? Okay. Um, and then after this person was shot, I think there was a, um, uh, the, the Border Patrol added that vertical wall behind it because it was, it was so narrow. Well, in this in this case, I went around and I went with somebody that gave me a, a you know a tour, uh, basically a writer and a, a photographer, and we traveled together since I didn't know if she's somebody who lives there. Um, many of the places, I, I think I showed you some pictures where you can walk around the wall. I often walked around the wall and was photographed from that side, and yeah, you know, I I would often be out there for two or three hours before Border Patrol would show up. So um, that's the other thing: you can hop the wall in 18 seconds or go around it and then be gone by the time any, anybody gets there. Uh, this is a pauper's grave in Holtfield, California. One of the problems with the wall, so the, building the wall in the last 10, 15 years, the escalation, has had a, 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 an effect that, that was unintended. And I mentioned that before, which is that people stop going, where they used to go back and forth, now they are staying here um, because they don't want to run the risk and all that problem. The other, the other issue is that they're often building the walls in larger urban areas, and it's forcing people to go out into more severe wilderness. And they originally thought that the idea would be is that it would discourage people from doing that dangerous, you know, going into 120 desert or mountain areas where it would be really dangerous. But of course, it doesn't stop them. So um, about three times as many people are dying now um, out in these remote wilderness areas than you know, have been in maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and then there's pauper graves, and of course when people die, a lot of times um, if they don't have documentation on them, so they're not, they're not identifiable. So these are actually many Jane and John Doe's, including children. That was a good segue. This is uh, another canto called the Water Stations, or actually it's called Agua. And um, this was actually the first photograph I made, 2004. I found this blue barrel with a flag sticking out in the middle of nowhere in the California desert. And I photographed it just because it was so compelling and strange. But I didn't know what it was for. And then since I've been working on this project, I've discovered that there's these different humanitarian groups that put water out. Often they're driven by religious, um, religious beliefs. Um, often they are Republicans and Democrats. They, you know, they um, get a whole wide range of, of of uh, people, academics, um, um, lay people. Um, um, anyway, so what these have in them, and this is in California, it's a group called Water Stations that put these out. And there's um, about 150 stations in California alone by this group called Water Stations. And in each one of these big drums are four uh, single gallon water um, jugs. And then every two weeks they go and they check to see if any have been used. That way they know if people are using them, and then they, at that time, they'll replace them. And they do this during the summer, you know, the peak from spring to fall, when it can get up to like 110, 120 degrees. And it's, uh, and this group has been doing it since 2001. They're still doing it. Um, these are amazing, amazing groups. And in Arizona, uh, Texas, and New Mexico, there's other groups too. This is a water station at night. And this is like one what I, what I call super grid, where I'll just put them all together in one massive. And these are mostly shot with like the iPhone. Another group I went out with is called No More Deaths. They're in Arizona. Uh, they are much more um, led by a group of anarchists and um, uh, they push back against the Border Patrol in a really big way. And uh, this group will go out, they will actually map where people die the most, and they'll hike out into really remote areas. The other place where the water stations are, you could actually pretty much drive to and carry those big barrels in the back of your trucks and things like that. These places, you can't get those barrels out there because they're so remote, so they carry the water gallons um, into the wilderness. And I went out with this, um, with Lee, uh, took eight hours to go to two places, and we just hiked. And shoot. first we drove with the Jeep, then hiked the rest of the way, and it took eight hours to, to place two water stations. And that, what we do is put water out there and food and emergency supplies. And, and it'd be in places that we've been before, so you could see if they've been used, and they had been used. It was really amazing. 
What they also do is they do what's called SARS, search and recovery. Um, the next day after I did this, um, they were going out to a bombing range in the Arizona desert where they were going to be hiking for eight hours a day looking for bodies. When people don't, when families report that people have gone a certain direction and they don't show up at the other end, um, that means they probably have been lost um, out in these areas. And so they go and they recover, they search until they find the bodies, they find them and then call them in and then arrange to get them sent back to the families in Mexico or Central America. Unfortunately, um, the Border Patrol and vigilantes slice the water bottles when they find them. So you can see that this is slashed and I find a lot of these. They leave them there to send a message. This one's also slashed a different year. They use, sometimes they use the water stations as for target practice. So this is just riddled with bullets. Right next to this orange one, green one, there's a grave site for four, four migrants that, that died because uh, the water was, had been used by a group that had gotten there before them. Um, so you can see the flags, it's a way of um, sort of letting people know at a distance where things are. Um, and at the end of a long summer season, with, after the wind and the, and the sun, these things are usually shredded and faded and basically they can't be used another season. So after the 2014 or 15 season, I remember I, I brought back 150 of these for Guillermo to use for his scores. So he turned the scores into, I mean, the flags into scores that he printed. Um, Guillermo also used many of my photographs uh, as the base for the graphic scores. This is a piece that he, we performed in Princeton two days ago. Uh, Guillermo flew out, and this is called Skeletal Remains. And we're now working actually on a, on a video um, um, with uh, the singer Amy X. Newberg, she's a four octave, uh, a vocalist in California that's actually seen. This is actually based on my photograph and a forensic report uh, from Arizona about um, how people died in a certain area, what, what parts of their bodies were found, and um, the locations, things like that. And it's quite powerful and, and beautiful and, and disturbing as well. Another score with the surveillance cameras. This is a personal favorite of mine. It's, um, it's one of my targets turned on its side so it becomes a reclining Buddha, which I thought was kind of an amazing uh, intervention. Uh, Guillermo derives a lot of his ideas from ancient Aztec culture, uh, but he's also Buddhist and he's, he's very spiritual and he brings very strange, interesting mix of, of cultures to bear on this project. Really quite beautiful. Uh, next canto is the artifacts, uh, and it's interesting. So along the border, you'll find human artifacts. There'll be backpacks, water bottles, tennis shoes, um, uh, just leftover human artifacts is the best way to put it. And often people on the border refer to it as trash. Uh, Guillermo feels really strong. There's an ancient Aztec tradition that says that every object has a soul, has a voice, if you will. And so, um, it's become kind of, this project's been where I will find these, a uh, document where I find them, bring them back for him, and then he kind of reanimates the, the life of these things. And that's the way he sees it, that that's what he's doing with these things. He's sort of letting, letting these things speak again. And um, so these are just some, this is a backpack. They're black cotton slacks and a tuna can. This is a wrapped water jug. You see this a lot because it gets so hot that uh, wrapping it keeps it cool in the summer temperatures. Uh, tuna. See lots of religious artifacts. Teddy bears. And I mentioned before with the, with the cutting of sign, the whole idea um, 
that the Border Patrol drags those things, those tires, is to smooth out um, the path so they can see footprints. But um, the migrants coming across the border know about this. So what you also find along the border are thousands and thousands of uh, what are called um, foam booties and carpet booties, which is they tie them around their feet with some twine, walk across and, and then dump them. Um, and it makes the Border Patrol crazy because they're very effective, so they don't leave any footprints. So this is a, a foam booty. And then uh, in the tree there, you can see there's actually a that little piece of cloth that's actually a, a carpet booty, and you can see the wall behind it. This is a close-up of the Dr. Trivago. Um, uh, this was kind of amazing in, in the exhibition. Um, the, the book is there, I brought that back, and um, the photograph showing where I found it. And then Guillermo's had people read the Spanish version of this Cold War, Cold War, Cold War classic. And what's interesting about it um, is that if you change the names from Russian to Spanish, it's totally relevant today. Kind of strangely bizarre. There's just so many passages that suddenly, you know, um, so that's just an uncanny little discovery. In the exhibition, it's a 32 foot long um, composite of all the artifacts. In early 2015, I found, as I mentioned before, you find um, human artifacts, belongings, all the way up and down the border. In Texas, I found three fields of just children's things. And it was really bizarre and weird and disturbing. And this is uh, the tennis shoes of a four-year-old. I um, found uh, children's Bibles and uh, tweezers and backpacks, and, but no adult things. And over the next six months, and probably you heard this, NPR was doing these pieces on these 52,000 unaccompanied um, children from Central America. And it turns out that this, this is where they were coming in. So I, I actually brought these back. And Guillermo made a micro orchestra out of these. Um, and so he plays them. We went into a sound booth and just with a really, really powerful mic, he recorded the sounds from these, these children's items. And I'm going to play you a little clip. It shows him performing them. things that I found which are just amazing to me. Remember the wall cost about four to twelve million dollars a mile to build and then somebody made a ladder out of these tree logs and probably got over the wall in you know, 15 seconds. So um, found a bunch of ladders which are in the, in the exhibition. I brought those back. Um, these are inner tubes that people use to cross uh, the Rio Grande. Uh, this was really unusual. Um, I discovered that in Tijuana area, there's these hills. And people figured out if you throw a bike over the wall and ride down really fast the hills, um, there's, there's sensors in the ground that pick up footsteps, but it doesn't pick up bicycle wheels. So they would start doing this. And the Border Patrol caught on to it, and they would catch them or get the bikes. And then they drive over them with their bikes and crush them, and, so the, they, and then leave them there. And that was part of, again, the message, this sort of cat and mouse game. So this is a crushed bicycle that I brought back. And then Guillermo, inspired by Marcel Duchamp. And I want to make a quick point about that. One of the things that's really interesting about this project, on one level, of course, it's about the border and all those obvious issues. But uh, Guillermo is sort of a, a composer that's caught in the, in, in the world where he's not, in a sense, accepted into the Western canon. So all throughout this project, if you look at, think about it, the Zapatella, which references Leonardo da Vinci, the uh, micro orchestra, the small hand things, that's actually uh, very similar to a Christian Marclay piece done uh, with Fluxus, um, just a little hand orchestra, but this, again, it's got political intent. 
um, the Marcel Duchamp, you'll see that a lot throughout, and John Cage in terms of the scores. So um, there's, there's humor in there that's settled in there. There's a critique, uh, questioning of, of the, the Western canon too, which is interesting. Um, and then this is the Listo, which is made from the tire, and actually a, a chair that I brought back. And that's Guillermo playing the Listo. And this is an early photograph of this mountain and a Normandy fence, and Guillermo used that as the inspiration for this wooden um, percussion instrument. Uh, these mountains are based on that last photograph. And nails I brought back from the border, oops, I'll show that in a minute, um, simulate the fence. And then also I brought back two children's Bibles from, from uh, in where I mentioned in Hidalgo County, where I found all those children's artifacts. And he used the pages of the Bible to, as the flooring for the, for the wooden instrument. And that's Guillermo playing it. No, it's actually carved wood, and it's got incredible sound. Um, you can go to bordercantos.com, and there's uh, samplings of the different sounds and instruments, too. It's, um, uh, and video, there's, you know, in great detail, and you'll, you'll hear this thing. It's pretty wonderful. In fact, uh, I mentioned in the exhibition, there's a thing called um, uh, the Sonic Borders. It's eight of these instruments, including this one. Each one's been recorded and has a speaker that just projects its own sound. It's a four hour and 20 minute piece based on the Aztec calendar that loops. And sometimes it's one instrument at a time, sometimes it's a symphony of all eight. And to me, it's the, better than my work, it's the best thing in the whole exhibition. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just a phenomenal thing. And now obviously most people are not gonna go sit there for four hours and 20 minutes. I dare any of you to do that, but but that said, it's, it's worth it. And the longer you stay, the better it gets. I mean, first you go in there and it just, you just hear one thing going and slowly it, it just manifests into something much, much greater than any given instant. It's, it's amazing sound duration piece. Um, and by the way, the show, it's going to Crystal Bridges Museum um, uh, after this, uh, I think early 2017. And then Pace is doing the show. Uh, Pace Galleries in Chelsea are gonna be doing, taking the museum show in summer 2017. So um, if you're around, that it's opening Amy Carter next week. Yes, I think some of them Guillermo recorded. Each one was recorded individually, but then he'd have a, um, a great percussion, this amazing percussionist do the, some of the percussion things. And uh, his wife plays piano, you know, a great pianist. So she, she played some of the other instruments. And yeah, they're all individually recorded in, a, in this, actually Roy Lichtenstein's son has a sound studio in, La, in Cal, uh, Oakland, California. And uh, um, it was all recorded there and it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, these are a pair of slacks I found in, in Texas and I brought them back and Guillermo ground them up and used, turned them into paper pulp that this 10 foot score, which is in the show, was printed on. So those, those pants have resurfaced as this beautiful paper. The last canto is called The uh, Other Side, a play on the other, obviously. Uh, one of the things about the border wall in recent years, the original wall was solid, but it would, it would cause all kinds of environmental problems, um, especially flooding, not letting smaller animals through. So the more recent designs, the Richard, what I call the Richard Serra designs, um, allow for uh, both water and small creatures, there's slats in them. Sometimes they have mesh like this. Uh, this is kind of a long story, but basically in California, there's a place, a small place where the, called Friendship Circle, where the Border Patrol allows family members or friends on both sides of the border to talk for two hours on Saturdays and Sundays. And, um, but they got, got this mesh uh, so that you can't pass things through very easily. And they stand there and watch you and they only allow a few people at a time. So I met this woman named Veronica and we had an amazing discussion for a half hour and then after that, if I ran into her on the street, I would not know what she looks like. It's, it's actually, it's kind of Orwellian, the friendship circle naming, because it, it, it's just, um, yeah. Anyway, and then this is, uh, you can see the slats um, getting to allow water through. 
Um, I think inadvertently, um, the metaphor is a, a prison cell. Um, what I'm going to do here in, is show some full images. Some of these pictures are 10, 12, and 14 feet long. Um, so I'll show details so you can see what's going on. So here you can see a dark shadow on the other side. Obviously, very dangerous looking. And it's a little boy giving me a peace sign. Uh, this is in Nogales, where you can see through into the city. And when you look at a detail, you can see kind of the street scene, almost like a Gary Winogrand street scene. Uh, this is a site where a, a young 16-year-old was shot through the wall. Border Patrol had to put their, their gun through the slats in the wall to shoot him, which is uh, inter, you know, illegal internationally, and, and killed the boy. And uh, these are protest stickers uh, from, from last year. In Nogales, I thought this was pretty kind of amazing. Uh, on the other side, on the Mexico side, there's a telephone pole, and someone had the wherewithal to write, fuck USA, <laughs> just at the right <laughs> thickness so that the Border Patrol could see it all day long as they drive past. <laughs> Uh, these are the two boys playing soccer, and this is when I got that, when I finally figured out why I kept finding balls everywhere. And uh, those guys, when I first saw them, I thought they were running, they are probably running drugs or something. I just went into the stereotype mode, and I stopped and watched, and I got out my little iPhone and actually made a film, and then realized that they were playing soccer and using the, and kicking the ball up against the wall. And anyway, and they, they saw me filming. We, we had kind of a, a really fun exchange back and forth. But it was like a, one of those moments like, oh, yeah. This is a really large piece, 12 feet long. And there's a detail you can see. Quite extraordinary. Um, this is, I'm actually photographing on the Mexico side of the border, but I'm in the US. So this is in Texas. So I'm photographing this guy mowing his lawn. He actually, in some cases, people use the, the wall as part of the lawn ornamentation. And he's got this beautiful flowers and grasses, and he's there on his, his deer lawnmower. My last picture I'll show, uh, this is a Tijuana. This is a real important picture for me. Uh, I think this one's about 12 feet long. And again, you can see here that on the US side, where it's really militarized, nobody's using this incredible beach that goes into the Pacific Ocean. But on the Mexico side, on Tijuana side, People are building sandcastles and swimming and barbecuing, and they're having a blast. And so, it, again, the play on the other, it's like, which side would you want to be on? You wonder. So this is details now, what you can see on the other, in through, the, through the wall. And finally, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sh uh, show, uh, uh, play an audio clip without any visual. Um, what I want you to think about, this is what, what I'm playing is Guillermo's piece. This is actually one of the first things I heard of his, um, where he uses instruments made from things on the border. Um, but when you stop and you don't see what he's making out, it's amazing the sound that he evokes out of it. So I'm just going to, it's about 45 seconds, so just listen. happy to take questions now. Yes. Sure. 
Sure. Uh, the question was, is the, the gist is over 10 years, how did I actually work there? Basically, um, it was such a long stretch of place, I didn't take my camper, my trusty camper. I would fly to places, rent a car, uh, sometimes a 4x4, four because four, some of the places I went was pretty remote. Um, I generally didn't camp out there. I think it would have been too dangerous by myself. I, I tend to go alone. I love going alone. Uh, sometimes I met people during the course of the project, really great people um, uh, in Brownsville, Texas. There's this uh, uh, guy, Scott Nickel, who um, would take me out to some places or um, in Tijuana, um, somebody hooked me up with somebody that lived down there that was interested. And so sometimes I had a guide. Uh, but most of the time, I'd say 98% of the time, I went by myself. Uh, Guillermo and I went once for two days, and the writer, Josh Kuhn, uh, for our book, who just got the MacArthur, by the way, um, uh, I took him out. We, we, we traveled for a couple of days, but otherwise, it was, it was solo. And I would just go, you know, dawn and be there and then work all day and then come back and crash and then go out again. Yes? Right, so the, I've, in the last, okay, the, the water station, the, the blue, blue water tank with the flag was, I shot with an 8x10 camera. That was the only picture in the series where I was using film still. Uh, since then, um, I've gone over to the dark side. I now shoot digital, and I was shooting a Hasselblad with a phase back. For the bigger pictures, for the 14 foot long ones and 12 foot, that's actually the, the new, the new um, digital backs are amazing. And then I was shooting my iPhone. I started with the iPhone 4 or 5 and just over the years and then escalating up. Yes? Sure. Did you talk to the border patrol or were you trying to sort of stay one step ahead of the. Um, there's no staying. I, I was in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, what, what, yeah, everybody wants to know about my relationship with the border patrol. That's pretty much who, all who I saw out there. I never saw people coming over the border. They would probably keep a clear distance from me if they saw me. You know, uh, so, but the Border Patrol, um, generally many of the places I photographed when it wasn't urban, uh, I would set off ground sensors. And so it would be sometimes two or three or four hours before they'd get out there. And then they come and they, they would, you know, want to see what I'm doing and you know, do all that. So I, I learned a couple of years into it, the uh, Jedi uh, mind meld, which is um, uh, rather than be disturbed right at the best light where I'm photographing, I would actually go out there find the closest border patrol, and I'd go up, I'd drive up really fast, and I'd go up and I'd say, hi, my name is Richard Mizrak. I'm doing a book on the border. I'll be out here for three or four hours. Can you let your you know, colleagues know I'll be out here? And they go, oh, yeah, sure, thanks. Because they just want to make, you know, just by doing that, it, it put them at ease that I wasn't, up, I wasn't smuggling drugs, that, you know, by being so aggressive. It put them at ease, and then they didn't bother me. And sometimes they actually watched out for me, actually. Sometimes there were some things, but yes. There's 680 miles of wall that's built. Uh, for for Trump to build the rest of the wall, it costs about 25 billion. That's that's actually conservative. And most of Oh, oh that, you're just talking about construction. You're not talking about monitoring it, which is huge, but uh, all the other stuff that goes along with that. And you know, he would want more personnel. And, and they have found in the in recent, last 10, 15 years, the more they've escalated building the wall, the more problems it's created because it keeps people from going back over the border. And in fact, in the last four years, it, the, the bottom line is, I hope I haven't already said this, but um, the dynamic is push-pull. It's known as push-pull, which is that as long as we buy the drugs, the cartel's going to get drugs to us. As long as we need workers for our economy, they're going to come here because there's jobs. The second that uh, employers are either prosecuted um, for hiring illegals, then they won't, they won't have jobs. But um, that never happens. Only, only migrants are, are uh, prosecuted because they're poor. The thing is, is we don't really want that because actually our economy is desperate to keep that inexpensive labor. So the whole thing is political spectacle. There's, there's absolutely no legitimate building the wall, adding more border patrol, spending a fortune on, on mil and you're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars that could go to um, things like fighting terrorism, 
uh, for education. It could be better money better spent, but it, it's not as good a political s symbol, and it doesn't fulfill the xenophobic you know component about it, which you know historically our country has always had. It. Every country has that. So yes. So actually, that's a good question. Um, the question was, for you that didn't hear it, um, had I, with, was the water station sort of the set off the, the project? No, because I didn't know what it was at the time. I looked at the board over the years just because I've been working in the American desert, but I never, it never really hit me until around 2009 when I started to see that expansion of wall building and militarization of the border. Then I felt like something major was in the works. And, and, and the first pictures of the effigies, which I found on the border, that, was, that really got my attention. And then also those big walls starting, those, those you know, Richard Serra uh, crystal-like walls going through the desert. I went, the, the crystal, so what's interesting about um, the wall, it's like the opposite of the Statue of Liberty or even the Golden Gate Bridge, which the Statue of Liberty is, you know, we welcome the tired, the weary. The wall represents the anti-monument. The wall now says, stay out, we don't want that. It's a big sh seismic shift in our national kind of persona. So. We have time for one more question. Uh oh. Uh, I'm going to take two. One, okay. two. And, that's, and then I need to sign books. Yes. Yeah, um, basically, um, I'll, that's a good idea for you to do. Um, people always come up with really good ideas for me to do, but you know, I think you know, my interest is really in the landscape and how, how America manifests in our landscape, if you will. And, um, and, and I don't feel comfortable photographing people in that situation. I just, it's, that's a long, long story for another time, but, but I, I think it's a viable, definitely good idea, interesting idea, it's just probably not gonna be me. But, and last question. Yeah, so the question was, is uh, basically, did I ever think about a, like a third voice? Um, we, at Princeton the other day, we were an archaeologist saying, oh, wow, you, somebody, you should have an archaeologist write about what this means, you know, the archaeology of the present, for example. Or somebody else was saying that, um, I mean, th there's a number of different, uh, there's policy potential, but, you know, this is an art project. And in the end, um, uh, it came down to, uh, which I'm really excited about, we, um, two cultures, uh, representing two mediums, you know, a musician and a photographer, coming together, bridging this sort of border issue. It's a really nice metaphor. Just, just the act of us working together, I think, for a project about the wall is about it. So we have our own level of symbolism. It's very, it only touches one little aspect. There's so many other approaches, uh, potential for looking at the border. Obviously, it's a huge issue. So your point's well taken, but we just, we couldn't, it would have been something completely different. And that, on that note, thank you, and I, I think they want to sign books.